Hola, comadres. Welcome to the seventh episode of Comadrendo. I'm your host, Marcy. We have an amazing guest today. His name is Mo, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. Hi, I'm Mo Siraj. Uh, I have a 15 uh, year old son who has uh, muscular dystrophy. Um, he's been, he was diagnosed since he was like, uh, I guess, two years old, at least uh, in terms of special education wise and his his diagnosis uh muscular dystrophy was around six years old so i do have a lot of you know, many years of experience with ieps and you know um, dealing with uh, issues with kids with disability so, okay thank you for having me <laughs> i'm glad you're here yeah, yeah. so today's topic is all about yes. ieps and one of the reasons why the topic came about was a lot of parents um, are new to the special education arena. I actually got a comadregram regarding an IEP, um, kind of asking me what to do to prep for the IEP. Um, and I feel like this is an important topic that is cloaked in a lot of mystery. So we're gonna try to shed some light on the topic. Uh, you already shared with us your son's diagnosis. So initially when he, he was in um, early intervention, what was the diagnosis before he got the diagnosis of muscular dystrophy? Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, I would say when he was two years old, um, I made an observation that he was not communicating a lot. Um, he wasn't using a lot of words. Uh, so I, I was kind of concerned about it. Uh, at the time, uh, I was going to BMCC and um, I, I was with a BMCC, there was special education programs uh, at BMCC. So at a time um, I had one of the students, I actually was in speech class. Was, that's kind of where I met one of the students who was in the early childhood education program. And I'd ask uh, her, uh, hey, uh, is there any uh, particular um, number, like how, how, how many words should be a, a child be speaking? like in terms of their um, uh, age, in terms of the progress. And she was like, well, he's supposed to be speaking this many words. And um, so at the time she, she recommended that I contact uh, early intervention, look it up online. I think I contacted 311 at the time and they referred me to a social worker. And then he, from there he got evaluated. At the time his diagnosis was um, speech delay. That was the diag or that's, that was the first diagnosis that got him into uh, special education. So uh, it was speech delay, and I believe he was also he also had like a, I guess occupational therapy as well um, uh, with that. So that was the initial diagnosis around two years, two and a half years old. Um, so yeah. How was that for you? That initial um, I believe is the IFSP meeting where you get the diagnosis and they're basically giving you services for your son based on the evaluations that they had done be previously. Yeah, so I was not, I was completely unaware of any of any special education, uh, had no knowledge about anything special education. Um, I didn't know any anything. So at the time they had him do multiple evaluations I had the initial IP meeting at the time. I was moving to New York from New York to New Jersey, but I had everything done in New York. So um, I had the meeting. They explained to me what um, his his deficits were, and you know what the what recommendations they had. And um, at the time, they you know they put you into special school with with, um, with the special teachers. You know um, they have to be certified. Um, and, uh, and, and they have like, a kind of like, they tell you like speech therapy, how many days a week and, and that kind of thing. So we had a meeting, they explained to me what was going to happen. Uh, after I did the IP meeting, uh, I, I transferred to New Jersey, um, it's New Jersey. I would believe that most, almost, if not every state that you live in, uh, would have an early intervention program. So if you, if you may not live in New York and maybe the audience out here may not live in uh, New York or New Jersey and maybe another state. So I would, I would highly recommend that you would 
uh, look at look look up your social services in your state and uh, look up early intervention. I believe most states will have some kind of program uh, of early intervention. So um, moved to New York, New Jersey, and then I was transferred him uh, using uh, it was a social worker, and they eventually got him into school. So it was kind of the beginning of the process. And I was just starting to understand what was going on. At the time, I just needed, I understood that, I accepted that he needed help in terms of his communication because it was, I understood that the a child's ability to perform very well in school, at, at least I learned that in college you know, at the time, like, because you learn that in psychology and development and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I understood that you know, the main, the early years of development, one to five, the critical years, especially when it comes to communication, reading, and that kind of thing. So I understood at a minimum, like, okay, well, I need to get him ready because if he gets into uh, kindergarten, he'll 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 be, uh, you know, far behind the rest of the the, the other kids. So, so that was my initial um, experience, and so I was kind of happy to have been able because at the time. I don't believe there was three K because the pre the pre K program in New York City is relatively I believe new, um, the like you know the mandatory universal pre K. You are correct. Um, right, right. Uh, and and New Jersey, I don't think there is that. I'm not sure if there is in that program right now in New Jersey, but like mandatory. But at the time I was doing it, they would not um, um, enroll a kid because at the time he was two years old, you know. Uh, mandatory, I think not mandatory, but the, the age threshold for, um, I think pre-K in Jersey was like, uh, three years old or something like that. Um, uh, so at the time he was two, he was, he was two and a half, um, or he had just turned two. So it was, so to get him in school, you had, I would have to wait, I would have to wait another year, but early intervention starts, um, pretty early, you know, um, so you have to speak to based on, you know, uh, how you observe the child, sometimes recommendations from the pediatrician um, or your own observation about how the child is developing. Um, and, and you kind of have to, like, uh, get a little bit of knowledge. That's why it's, I would say, important if you're having a child, kind of maybe read some books on uh, early development. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, good information there, too. So um, that's... That's what I would say in terms of if you're if you're if you're if you uh, if you have any issues or if a child who's younger and at a time like I said for children under a certain age to get them into a program where they're getting help um, uh, you would have to uh, contact your like early intervention program and then they would evaluate them and uh, decide well from there we'll see how they're they're doing you know? so. Thank you. Um, I want to chime in also. Uh, I noticed that when my son initially he um, began speaking um, and I want to say around 18 months, he had about 25 words and around 18 months he became silent. Um, when I noticed that, uh, I wasn't the one that noticed, it was actually my aunt and um, she pointed it out to me. Uh, I brought it up at the next um, meeting with the pediatrician and the pediatrician basically told me that I should wait and see um, to see if the speech would come back. But developmentally, if a child is speaking, they are not supposed to lose language. So that is a major red flag. Um, so what I had to do was basically advocate for my son to be sent in for these evaluations. Um, my my argument to, to the pediatrician was basically if there's nothing wrong then they, we have nothing to lose but if there is something wrong um time is of the essence it's it's important to do the early intervention at first before um there's a larger delay or a larger gap in development um so once a child turns three I believe is when it turns in, no, I'm lying. When a, when a child turns five is when it turns into an IEP. So at first, first is an IFSP, Individualized Family Services Plan, and then it becomes an IEP, which is an Individualized Educational Plan. Um, so Mo, do you want to give the definition of what an IEP is? 
All right, guys, so we were having a little bit of a technical difficulty. Um, the last question I asked Mo was, um, well, we were talking, discussing how um, after the age of four, it turns in from an IFSP, which is an Individualized Family Services Plan, to an IEP, which is an Individualized Educational Plan. And what is the difference? So Mo is going to give us a definition on that. Yeah, so an IP is basically an individualized education plan, and, and that's when they get to kindergarten. And the whole idea behind the, 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 the IP is that the IP will state um, where it will give a description of the kid, where he is at, he or she is at, um, in terms of their development. So all the evaluations will be incorporated into the IP, and each, um, each person, based on the analysis, will determine uh, what goals that the kid is supposed to have, and it's typically, I think it's like maybe four different areas at least a minimum. They'll, so there'll be a social, there'll be a psychological, there'll be an, edu an education, at least an educational um, a plan. So, and, and, and uh, they will be um, monitoring how the kid performs in all of these different areas. And, um, and uh, so, and it might be in, in some cases, like, like if a kid has like a speech, deficit or some of those things, they will also be, you know, they'll be tracing those things. If there are certain, like, um, occupational therapy or even phys physical therapy in some cases, they will also be tracking those things. And and the whole idea is to uh, either get the child up to, uh, work them up to their grade level <clears throat> and to work on the deficits that they have uh, to get to the grade level, or in some cases, if they're not at grade level, they're you know, they have certain goals that they're intending to meet as they go along, and this will progress as they go to school. And so it's a very important. It's, it's also a legal document. Uh, it's enforceable in the courts, uh, the district, or um, that you, and regardless of where, it, throughout the United States, um, every state uh, does have this. IEPs are like, almost like uh, any other document. They are, um, they are uh, they are transferable across states. So if you have a legal IP in New York, and you move to California, you tell the California district that my kid has an IP, and you provide them that document, that school district. Once you do that, once you provide them that document, you don't have to uh, do any kind of reevaluations or anything like that. Um, they may they may need to do something um, just to for their own purposes. You know, for the um, because I had to go kind of go through a similar issue once I got the IP legally in New York and I transferred to New Jersey. Then <clears throat> New Jersey, um, you know, they they took the IP and then they had their own, uh, you know, those people who are going to perform the therapies at least do a check, kind of see whether it's in line with the IEP and. Yes. Um, because I believe that the IP that there is a there is a um, a requirement I believe in the IP um, how often uh, evaluation should be done I think I believe yes. in New York is like every two years or something like that um, so yeah so it's very like it's, it's very important that the IP is 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 there as a, also it's very important as also a means to provide services yes. And it could provide services, they could provide equipment. There's a whole host of things. Uh, in my son's case, I had, um, I, they, I, they, they created a special classroom because he was under, and it was younger at the time. So they had to create a special classroom within the school because they, these are kids of uh, low grades. And um, they also had to um, provide, and later on, they had to provide like an aid specifically for him in the school because he was physically disabled and uh, at the time he was in a wheelchair and he physically could not uh, push himself or he needed assistance using the bathroom. So uh, that's, you know, they have to provide uh, an aid or in, in, in his case, uh, an LPN, so to be certified person. So there's a lot of things that uh, the IP um, um, will, will it will have in its um, 
will be incorporated in the IEP based on the child's needs, each particular child's needs and disability. So that's kind of like a synopsis of it. Uh, each individual child is probably going to have uh, more, um, more or less, uh, depends on their particular situation. But yeah, that's kind of like the, the idea. So this is all under the IDEA Act, which is the act in which students with special needs um, are able to get a uh, a free and appropriate public education. So under the IDEA Act, um, students are supposed to be provided with the services that they need so that they can perform as close to, if not on the same level as their typically developing peers. So this is why it's important. Um, like Mo said, it is a legal document. If you find that um, your child is supposed to be getting certain services or you thought that they were getting services, you are entitled um, under the law to go after the school. And it's not something that you're being vindictive, but you're defending your child's rights. Okay. Um, Mo, so what can you, what kind of tips can you provide for parents to get ready for that initial um, meeting? Or how do you get ready for meetings? Because I know you have your own process um, when you walk in there so that you can get what you need for your son. Okay. Um, and action. All right, Mo, what can parents do to prepare for that first IEP meeting? I know you have your own method of preparing. Um, what could you what suggestions can you give parents when they walk into that meeting? Because I know it can be a little bit scary and um, daunting, uh, to say the least. Absolutely. It's a, it's a lot to understand and a lot to unpack, um, especially when it's your child. It's going to be a lot very emotional. It depends on the particular issues. Um, uh, so um, most of the times I will say this to someone, one, they will, they are required to give you a copy of all evaluations after they are completed. So whether you um, are intervention, whether it's the early intervention program or whether you request it through the school to get the evaluations done, they will give you a copy of those evaluations so you can see what the issues are. They can, ex they can also, before uh, the IPs, um, you can take notes on the pages that they give. They'll also give you a draft copy of they're required to give you before the meeting. And if you don't have one, um, they can give you a draft copy of the evaluation. Um, in some cases, if you're really concerned, um, you can ask, you can have the meeting recorded if you want to. Um, um, so that in, in the event that you don't remember something or they said something that you didn't understand, you can always go back and re-listen to it. That you usually have to tell them because they will send you like a, they typically will send a actual meeting request, um, um, you know, whether it's through the mail. Um, most of the time they're, they're required to send that. I'm not sure if that's done by email now, but they will send you a, a meeting request and it will have like, how do you plan on attending this meeting? Um, whether it's teleconference, whether it's uh, in person, um, and, and do you plan to record, you know, uh, the meeting? And so you just got to notify them and let them know that you are allowed legally to record the meeting um, if you uh, if you want to. I usually recommend record the meeting um, to any parents, especially the first time. And because the reason why, I would say that maybe um, at the same time, if you if you've done your research or you've spoken to like an advocate or someone. You know that maybe a special ed teacher or who has experience in education a little bit uh, who could kind of give you a little bit of guidance. Um, uh, you can get those through advocacy groups. Depends on, you know, the petitions. There are a lot of, you can Google them. There's a lot of advocacy groups that have a lot of information about them. I'm pretty sure if you go on YouTube, there's probably some other information on there. Um, on there, you probably get at least some idea of what the IP is. Um, you can take a look at the IP, write some notes. If you don't understand something, what does this mean? Because sometimes it can look, um, IPs can 
they can vary depends on, I, I guess I'm not sure what the state is, but how they are um, presented. Uh, it's kind of strange sometimes. You'll say they'll have 15%, you know, all these other low numbers, and you're going to be like, it's, you're not going to understand. So not a lot of, when I initially saw it, you're not going to understand a lot of things. So you want them to explain to you what it means, what does this mean, what does that mean, write your notes down, record it, and that way, because um, even after the meeting, the IP is not finalized, um, and you can, if you have more questions or you require changes, um, you could still, you know, have that done. Um, so it's so it's very important to understand what's going on, um, and you know whether like, even after the meeting is done, you can go and review it. Um, if they said something that was not accurate or you didn't understand, you can clarify that information. So yeah, and they will typically like they said after the meeting, they'll. Um, I mean, before the meeting, they'll give you a draft. Um, after the meeting, uh, you'll, you'll get, probably get a final. If there's no, if you have no um, disagreement with anything, they'll have a graph which you will sign, and it will have the signatures of everyone on there. Um, all you know, so you include whoever is in charge. But typically, I believe in most schools, the social worker is usually the one responsible for. The IPs, that's who is like usually the um, the school social uh, worker. I want to chime in on that. So um, not necessarily a social like, worker. Um, uh, there's a, usually a it's teacher. Not gonna be a principal it's um, their like the position is called uh, the IEP teacher, and worker. they're in charge mm -hmm. of making sure that the school is in compliance and that they are following the schedule for IEP meetings, and that um, things are being um, taken care of on time in a timely manner, and that things are doing being done the right way. I wanted to chime in as well because some schools tend to say certain people are at a meeting, but they're actually not. So just make sure whoever they say was present in the meeting was actually present because that can give you legal recourse to contest the IEP in a court of law as well. Um, one thing, um, one thing I do when I walk into the IEP meetings, I make sure I get the evaluations at least two weeks before the meeting that I had time to read through all the evaluations. If I have any questions regarding the testing that was done, I make sure that I ask those questions during the meeting. Um, also, I want to see what the goals are and have some input with regards to academic and um, socialization goals that they might have for my son in the IEP as well. Uh, most of the time I take a computer with me and I'm, um, cause I'm a faster typer than writer, but I definitely do take notes during the IEP meeting. Um, if it's something that I feel like is an issue, I always send a follow-up email to uh, the people present at the meeting and I CC the principal as well, just so that they are aware, um, if there is an issue or whatever is going on. Um, I had to actually had my have my son reevaluated. Um, I felt that he was in the wrong setting, so I ended up writing a letter and getting him a psychoeducational evaluation, which usually the school does not pay for. But because of the letter that I wrote and um, the findings that I found with regards to um, his development, and um, I was able to get that. Uh, paid by the Department of Education. So remember that, you know, as long as you have proof and you um, look for advice from people, you can always get what your child deserves and what they need. Um, do you want to say something? Also, also, I'll also like the... Um um, but then also the other things that we could possibly do. There are depends on the child's particular situation, and uh, depends on your insurance and stuff like that. Um, uh, you can um, you, you, uh, some insurance allow for speech therapy, like uh, as part of medical um, of the medical um, uh, insurance, and also um, uh, what a child neurologist. It might, and that's the very, like I said, it's dependent on the child's particular issues. Typically, if the child is very young, um, sometimes you may just want to do a check 
or maybe get a referral. Because pediatricians are good on like on a very, um, I would say for general health. So I, I look at pediatricians as a general practitioner for children, but um, children, a child neurology, their main job is developmental. You know, it's, it's very important. A lot of people probably don't know this. Their main job is the neuro, neuro, neurodevelopment. So in terms of often the child speaks, their behavior, how do they play, um, how do they interact with other people, um, uh, because there's a lot of small things that they will notice as part of the, and that's and sometimes it is extensive, those, those, those appointments, like getting a ch uh, child neurologist, um, those appointments could be like an hour long, you know, because the child neurologist is, they they, they, they'll have toys and they'll make the child do different things because there are different things a child's supposed to do coordinatively. They're supposed to, be able to coordinate things. They're supposed to be able to do certain things at a certain age. And, you know, and the child neurologist will measure how all of, how they're doing it. And, it, and, and those things, because um, autism and certain things are on a spectrum and there are, there's some very mild, from very mild to very severe. But a lot of times the, the what doesn't get detected is the ones that might be very mild. Like you may not be able to observe the certain things, but they're very, very things that they observe about the kids, the way the kids hand movements and facial eye contact. So things like that, a regular pediatrician might not be able to catch. Um, so not because somebody might be a doctor and they may be a very good doctor, you know, but just like, mm -hmm. it's like um, if you have a, um, if you have a, a heart problem, um, you're not going to go to your general family doctor. You're going to go to a cardiologist. Now, the regular MD is going to know some things about the heart, but a specialist is going to be, will be going deeper and looking at more things. Uh, that, 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 so that, that's, that is, I would, I would, depends on the child's particular issue. Um, if you, through your insurance, and now you know, hopefully most people have insurance. If you don't, I mean, there probably are ways to get around that. Um, you may be able to through the school. Depends on your particular circumstances. You may be able to get that through the school. Um, they may um, be able to provide you um, uh, if you needed that, just to make sure you can. Because it, it diagnosis is the big, the probably the most important thing I would say. When it comes to an IEP, it's the, it's, the, it's what kind of um, determines what is going to be in the IEP. It is kind of the basis. It's kind of like the evidence to prove. Okay, why does, do we should we provide these services? Is that if the evaluation can prove that hey, the child needs this, and I, in my own situation, I have used many times, many times, uh, doctors' evaluations, doctors' recommendations. And that has been the basis of what went into the IEP, you know. So, um, so it's it's very important that the weight of a doctor's report does go a long way. And, and, and the neural the the child neurology evaluation is very extensive. It could be like, you know, a, a three four page document. You know, um, they write everything. They they document it very well. So, I would this is something that I would I would also. Um, 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 ask you know parents if they um, if they have uh, the mm -hmm. ability to do so is to also explore that and because you want to go into these meetings with as much so I evidence agree with as you, you, um, you possibly can. There's possibly can. There's um, because that makes your case that are for whatever services you're looking for for you to be able to have enough evidence to be able to get the services that your child needs. Um, one of them is the neuropsychological, which was what you were talking about, um, where a neuropsychologist will evaluate your child. Um, usually these uh, meetings take up to three to four hours. Sometimes, depending on the child, they have to break it up between two to three days, depending on how long they can tolerate. Another one is the psychosocial. So um, how their development, psych like their psycho social development is going on. And then another one is the psychoeducational. So how their development um, psychologically in the educational arena. Um, these three reports are essential in, and we have a visitor. 
So these uh, three reports are essential in um, making sure that, uh, you know, you get the services that your child needs. So, um, so Mo, we've heard a lot about your son. Can you tell us a little bit more about him? Uh, what's, what's he like? Mm -hmm. What makes him sparkle? What are things that he enjoys doing? Yeah. No, he's like, a, my son is fairly uh, normal, normal kid in terms of at least his development. Socially, at least he's, he's fairly well developed. Uh, and, you know, he's, so he's a very, you know, he's a very comical uh, kid. Um, he likes video games. He likes to joke around. You know, every teacher, every teacher in the school kind of love, loves him. You know, they, they always like say, you know, he's, he's very, you know, he can be, he, he can be a very, um, uh, kind of, you know, he jokes around a lot. And, uh, and, uh, so, you know, he likes YouTube, he likes anime, he likes video games, so those kind of things. Um, so he's not, he's not, at least when it comes to, so he does, he, most of his disabilities as of right now is mostly physical because muscular dystrophy affects your physical m more. Um, um, and then part of muscular dystrophy is also affects speech. Um, so, which is, he gets concurrently like a uh, speech therapy and part of it is also, it's also a kind of like a helps from practice. Cause the other thing about speech therapy, it's not, it's not, um, just because someone can't speak. It's also speech therapies also help you. Um, if you, you know, some, like in his case, his, is his tongue is a muscle. And if your muscle needs to be practiced using certain words, that's why if kids stutter, even people who get into car accidents and stuff like that, you know, uh, they help them speak and talk and like help them pronounce words better and stuff like that. So it's not always, it's not always that because the child is like, oh, the child is not smart. It's just because it helps with articulation and stuff like that. Um, so, but he's, but he's, you know, he's fairly, uh, you know, um, you know, he's fairly comical. And, um, like I said, he jokes around, he'll, he'll say, he'll try to be very smart and ask like, you know, Did he uh, ask ever, um, I have a question because, kind of um, Aiden like, got, um, speech you know, like jokes, you know, so and he's, he's Aiden, a pretty when he kid, was younger, um, did so. as receive that as well when he was in <laughs> EI? Well, the speech, um, therapist that they gave him, um, helped him learn how to chew because he didn't know how to chew when he was like feeding. When, when you mean so feeding. I wanted to know if they gave that to Az as well. Oh, um, chew, I don't think chewing was a major concern. Um, I, I don't remember chewing was a major concern. Um, yeah, I don't think he had that problem, but he does. Like, so another problem with kids with particular muscular dystrophy, they they have a, a little bit, like, their tongue is a little bit larger than normal kids. It's not, like, that noticeable, but it's big enough where it kind of in, in, um, affects the, 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 the their mouth a little bit, you know. So that's the, they kind of work on, kind of work on that kind of thing. So because, because of the larger tongue, you know, and that muscle is, like, is like when they were younger, it's a little bit weaker. That's one of the reasons why they have, like, speech delay. Um, because of it, their tongue, you know. So, um, but uh, yeah, I don't think yeah. That's why the other thing is that swallowing, you know, and stuff like that. Also, like depends on the child. Um, they may recommend uh, like um, like like the chewy um, tubes, toys that helps with um, um, strengthen the jaw muscle. Like uh, so, like there are certain toys, you know, they're all safe and stuff like. That like chewy tubes and stuff like that, those help actually can help with your speech because they help when you chew on them. That's why some kids, um, you know, when they bite on a lot of things, that actually is not people who think, oh, stop biting. They're not biting it. They're biting it because it helps actually exercise their mouth a little bit. And it's also, it also acts as a, a soothing mechanism for them. It helps them relax. Um, so sometimes this is actually should be, it actually should be encouraged because sometimes some kids do do need that depends on the kid because if they have an issue but if you take it out that, that child could like it could it, sometimes it can help them focus you know so, so different that's why some different kids they will have like um 
like certain things even in their hands, like something to squeeze, you know? Uh, like I said, it depends on their particular issue. They may not need it throughout their life, but they, you know, but they may, they may need it as, as they're developing, you know, and it's not like it's, uh, I don't think any of this is a hobby for me. I haven't had a surprisingly, like, I mean, some people do have it till adults because I did have a coworker who, um, he, um, uh, you know, he used to have like these different things because he was, um, I guess he had certain issues. Uh, I can't remember what it was, but he would have these different things that give you different sensation. Like he'd have something that's heavy, like something to play with because he, he needed like, like focus, you know? So he would be like, you know, like little trinkets and stuff like that, that, um, you know, that kind of like, I guess helps with your focus or helps like relax your nerves or something like that. Because I guess sometimes you get your nerves, get some, or, you know, you can get like nervous or something like that. So you will have like things that he will just like, like play around, like, a, like, like almost like a Play-Doh or it's like someone with this, like a little weight thing or, you know, like different things, you know, so. They, 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 you know, some of these things so, they, they be surprised in, um, can be helpful even for adults. Communities of color, there's a um, lot of so, reservations. Or in college, or stuff like that. So, having yeah. your child evaluated and um, getting them an IEP. Uh, what would you say to those parents that have those uh, hangups or reservations regarding that? Yeah. So, so the thing is, is that I understand that is the case. Um, and a lot of the, I think one of the main things, there's a couple of things that I think that they have concerns about. One is a stigma and the kids may be labeled in the school. Uh, they may be bullied or stuff like that. Um, um, you know, most of the times that is not true. Um, you know, especially when we're talking about kids, the very much younger, you know, they don't really have that, have that problem, you know, um, uh, in the younger years. Um, uh, so, you know, I don't think that's, that should be worried about. And I, the, and, and what I would say to someone is that it's, it's the most important thing I would say is that it's, it's, it's better to get the child help as soon as possible because, um, those issues that they have early, um, can be amplified later in life. So if you don't get the help, if you don't get the help, and I think that's, that should be more concerning. If you were just expecting the child to function at the same level as every other kid, their expectations are going to be that of every other kid versus having an IEP where their expectation is based on the progression in within the IEP. You know, and that's a big, very big difference, you know. So they're not, they're, 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 the way they're measured and how everything, how they're progressing, they're progressing according to what the IEP says. And so a kid, a kid may be, for example, a numerical age, four years old or five years old, you know, but they could be operating on a one year behind. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know. I, I don't think, I don't think a year difference, I mean, for some people that might make a difference to them. But it doesn't really make a difference because sometimes they may keep a kid in the same classroom, um, um, a, you know, and progress with the cohort. Uh, depends on the situation. Um, but uh, you know, if, if they're they have if they're socially um, progressing with the cohort, they'll do, but they'll tailor tailor what they're learning according to their grade level and the work according to what they are capable of. You know, so um, I would say. Because the, the, the IP gives you to me, it gives you a tool that gives you, makes it flexible for you to be able to, um, for your child to be able to function in school. Because like I said, without the IP, and if they have deficits or they need services or they need any kind of equipment or anything like that, um, they will not get it, number one, because they, because they don't have anything to prove that they need it. And um, and the supports in the classroom that they would need, they would they would be assumed that they are functioning on the same level as every other child, and this will go on throughout high school. And what happens is that deficits will progress over time, and then when you get to high school, your child is now going to be even further behind because they're not going to be on reading level. They, uh, you know, they're going to have major deficits. I mean, it's, I would say I've seen situations where child needed glasses as an example, you know, um, because they even check the eyes and stuff like that. And I think it's part of the IP too. They'll check to see the vision and stuff like that. Um, so, um, and 
and the the kid is delayed delay because they can't see to read, you know, um, and that delays their reading, you know, and so, and you get to high school and they're expected to perform or graduate and do the same level of work as every other child. So you're giving them a significant, like, um, you put in them a significant disadvantage and that's how the kids get discouraged, um, and, and stuff like that. And, and, and it's not that because they can't learn, it's because they, they had issues and they, and they will know their issues. They will see their issues. Um, and they will notice it. And I, I like, uh, I would say to, to anyone that even, I would say it's better to get a kid up to the grade level. And even if they, even if it's take them a little bit longer, um, even to graduate high school. And I might say, Oh, well, Oh, I want a kid to graduate in time to me. I don't think it makes a difference because I mean, by the time you get to college, sometimes a lot of these issues, they become like if the kid was maybe a year behind, as you get further along, maybe down to high school, even college, those kids catch up, you know? And so, so it's not, it's not that they're not smart. It's that maybe they learn differently. Um, they have to learn if they have a deficit, they have to um, maybe have to find ways of compensating different ways um, to help them, you know, to help them learn or better ways for them to learn um, to absorb information and stuff like that. So um, what I'll what say to anyone who has reservations about that, is one, I think that it will help you more, um, your child more. It gives you legal, a legal right. You can, you can do a lot with an IP. You can, you can transfer, um, um, your kid from, if there's a certain school that does not provide services for that kid, they can move to another school that, that will, that will, that has the quality, the qualified teachers and, and stuff like that. So for example, I, I think my son goes to the Henry Scarty school. And there are kids who come from New York City who get bussed in from New York City to um, to to Henry Viscard, which is pretty far out in Long Island. Same thing in New Jersey, if you're living in any other state, that this is where where if you live in a district, let's say I don't I don't want to put any the district on, under the like let's say you live in Jersey City and Jersey City didn't have the classroom for your kid or Newark or something like that. And you're, and there is a, and in the, in the next town over, right? There is a, there's a school that provides that services. And if that school is incapable and they cannot provide the service, sometimes they will, they, the school district will pay to have the kid bust to the other school. And in my son's case, my son is from Valley Stream and goes to Valley Stream school, school district, but it's, it goes, is Valley Stream pays to bus my son to the Henry Viscardi School because the Valley Stream School District does not have all the services that Henry Viscardi has that would help support it. And so it's almost like in some cases it's cheaper because my son needs an aide in the school or someone to use the bathroom. They would have to hire someone, a full-time staff for him throughout the day. So it was almost in the best interest of the school to, to basically bus him to another school district. So that's the power of the IEP. And I can tell you right now, if you go to the suburbs um, and you go to more affluent school districts, uh, it is very prevalent. Like there are uh, many parents and you would be surprised for some of the most uh, minor things. If the kid has, a, even if the kid has also a medical problem, like they, are, they have a medical a particular problem uh, down to like medication, you know, in the school, they are to give the medication in the school. Um, they, they ha that's in the IP as well. So they may have the nurse, in the, you know, nurse be there to make sure they administer the medication properly. Kids could have diabetes and all this other stuff. So, um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot, it's a, it's a very powerful tool. Um, um, I, I would say when it comes to education and that it, 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 it if, if used right, it, it, it can be one of the best tools that you have for your kid. And it also deals with another issue it deals with is, behavior. So if you're, and this is a big problem, especially for kids of color. And, and this is a big problem I saw in, um, in New York city. And if you look at the true. statistics, kids of color have some of the highest rates of, you know, uh, detention and all these like administrative punishments, you know, and, um, you know, suspensions. It's some of the reasons why is that a lot of these kids are on, I would say undiagnosed. Uh, there's a lot of kids who are undiagnosed and they have uh, 
behavior problem. For example, my son uh, initially had a behavior problem uh, in school. And some of those situations, if he didn't have an IP, he would be would be suspended, you know. But because he had an IP, they have something, something they call behavior modification, which means that once they know in the IP that the child has certain behavior problems, they may be through tantrums, they may be get frustrated. And these could be normal behaviors sometimes as part of development. You know, maybe the kids is just maturity or whatever. And once, once the IP says, hey, this kid has some emotional problems, the IP will have methodologies in the school and in there on how to deal with the kid's problem. Maybe that kid, if the kid uh, gets into conflict with another child, they, the teachers in that classroom will know, okay, hey, let's take him out of the classroom, put him outside, let him cool off, because some kids may need, uh, they, don't have the, they don't have the ability to reg, self-regulate, so they may, need a time to breathe and come back into the work. Because sometimes the teacher might say, hey, hurry up, finish the work, finish the work, we need to get done, back up. And some kids sometimes need, like, prompting. So before they finish the work, they say, hey, why don't you guys hurry up, finish what you have to do once they get to the, when they, once they, once they, uh, um, once they get done. Or in some cases, they may need more, actually more time because if they're being rushed, they're not getting the work done on time and all of those kind of things. So because in the school, they don't really cater to individual children's needs. That's why the whole idea of these IEPs, individualized education, which to me, every child should have individualized education. But, you know, that's another debate. But uh, in your child's case, your child has an individualized education. So they're not going to mass uh, what what they're going to expect from every child. Oh, I need you to finish the test in 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And it actually doesn't matter, at least in the early years of development, that um, whether a child is able to finish an English test or math test in the particular time allotted, you know, it's like, no, the question is whether or not it's more important. It's like whether the child knows that information now, but for the purposes of school, they kind of have to time them or, you know, set some kind of boundaries. But if your child has an IP, they can say, hey, he has an IP and he has testing anxiety, you know? And if you go, like I said, if you go to the suburbs in Long Island, you'll see a ton of kids who have an IP and part of it is testing anxiety, as an example. Uh, and not to say anything about them, I'm not saying they're doing anything wrong. I mean, th that means the parents may, parents who knew that the kids may be nervous about taking tests or something, and it could be very minor. The kids I have been saying, hey, they need more time. They need an hour. And that 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 actually, that time applies to all different tests. That includes the regents exams. That includes any kind of mandatory state testing. That includes even the SATs. And that even travels over, carries over to college. Because even when I went to college, there were kids with IEPs who had to get what they call special testing accommodations. I had, I've had a kid, I had a kid in my class one time, I counting, and this was on the master's level. And he had, I think some kind he of had fine motor issues and his hand, he had, he couldn't really, it wasn't, his hand was, um, very low mobility in his hands. Um, so he needed a, yes, he had fine motor issues. He just couldn't, I mean, so he was allowed to have a recording device in the classroom so he can record the lectures because he couldn't write down notes. And he needed, um, and also he, I think in some cases he had a scribe in the classroom who would write down notes, so like a kind of like almost like a court reporter. Um, they would have a student or someone that was taking down notes for him. And when he did have a test, he would have tests under special uh, situation that the professor would, you know, if, if anybody goes to college, they would always notice a professor will kind of always give, uh, like in the beginning, when he gives you the, um, the syllabus, he gives, and he always says in the beginning, if you have any special requirements, let me know. Accommodations, you gotta let him know. And if you do take a test, he has to let you know. They have to, they actually have to do that legally. Say that legally, like if there's any um, particular type of accommodations, um, they will make those special accommodations test. So he'll he'll have to organize a test and, and schedule something where you'll be taking the test on the different. Like you can't take it in the time allotted during that particular uh, period. So the IP can travel all the way through university. You know, like I said, and I did that and I was in a 
a master's program. So this was not, this was someone who was, was this, this particular person was, he was at least in his like upper twenties. So, um, so what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that I would not, uh, IEP does not hold your child behind. It does not um, stigmatize you in any way. It does not make you um, less competent than any other child. The whole goal of it is to provide services based on the particular needs. And in some cases, like I said, to help you get to up to a certain level um, and meet those educational goals, especially in the early years. Um, and then maybe later on, it might not be that, it may be, it may be transformed into providing support services versus like, so the kids can function well, but they may need things like more time. They may need a scribe. They may need to record the classroom. Mm -hmm. They may need um, someone also reading out questions for them in some cases. Um, that, that depends on, you know, the child's particular situation because sometimes they need to hear because they're more auditory learners. And so they have to hear the question out loud. So th it, it, it is a very powerful tool. And so, but, but to be able to get those services, this is kind of the only way to do so. You cannot just go to the school and say, my child has a problem. The child has a behavior problem. What do I do? You know? <clears throat> And most schools, um, and, and I, you know, um, you know, don't, you know, it's kind of unfortunate. No one, as as far as I know, no, you know, even if a teacher uh, knows a child may have a problem, they cannot tell a parent. And you would think that you, and this is one very important to know. And I, this is something I learned, like while doing all of this. The teacher, if they're really, you know, sometimes they, you have a good relationship with them, some teachers may tell you. They may tell you. Like, very, uh, un, you know. Um, how legally, say, you can't. Um, I can tell you as record, a teacher, legally, you, know? you cannot. But they cannot tell a parent that, hey, your kid has a problem. You should get it evaluated. That is almost right. Legally, legally, you cannot. Legally, the teacher will never tell, the teacher will never tell you that if, like, if you get a child evaluated, I may be able to, you know, help you with, you know, better your, your child with the classroom. And unfortunately, that's one of the problems in many, in, especially in poor school districts where people are, they, like I said, it's most of it is they're not informed. And I'm, like I said, like I was going to college at the time and there are plenty of people um, at the time, my ex, my, in fact, at the time, I would say it was interesting. Uh, my ex was a teacher. But she was not really specialized as a special education teacher. So even all the stuff that was going on, she was actually not even familiar with. Like, so you be so you can you imagine like someone who's went to school for education and a lot of people who's college educated, they don't you don't understand this because most people don't a lot of people don't have to deal with it. But but um if you do if you do have to deal with it, um it's you know, it's 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 another it's a lot of education. It's a lot of uh, understanding. It's, it requires a lot of work to un to understand what's going on. But um, you know, if, if you do have a, a child in that particular surgeon, is your child's parents to advocate for the best quality of education for your child? So, I would say it's 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 very important that you do whatever you can to provide them the best uh, support that you possibly can. You know, even if you live in New York City, and or you live in like you maybe live in not the best. Uh, your school district might not be the best or anything like that, but you'd be surprised like, like what you can do. Like if, if your kid might not, the school district that you live in, like, for example, even I'll give an example of my son again, the, my son was able, even in Jersey city, I was within Jersey city. They would tell you that, Hey, your school, your child is going to this, what they call homeschool district, which means where you live, the closest school district to that particular school because he had an IEP the school th that that particular school did not have a classroom because that classroom for example my son had to be in a classroom that had to, that at the time when he was below a certain age because of his uh, deficits at the time because he needed more attention it the ratio of teacher to student had to be a certain number it couldn't be over a certain number so that's and that's a very powerful thing because if there's or if there is a mandatory requirement 
to have a special education teacher. That means there's two teachers in the classrooms um, and, and the ratio of teacher to student is a certain number. So for example, like I said, if your kid doesn't have an IEP and they have a deficit, they're going to be in a classroom with one kid uh, to 30, you know, with 30 students, whatever the maximum allowable amount of kids in the classroom, plus no support, which means that there's no additional teacher there. In some cases, they may have an aide, but a teacher's aide is not the same thing as a special education teacher. A special education teacher um, will be aware because in what I, th I think yeah. it's called inclusion, right? When they have like so a there's mix of ICT class, inclusion classes which when is they have a mix of some kids, especially ed, classroom, some kids are, um, there's two you know, teachers, one have, special you know, education like teacher, and one teacher that is a general education right. teacher, and they both teach the entire class together. There's a certain ratio of children with IEPs in there. Um, the integrated classroom is less children with IEPs and more children that are um, general education students. Right. And yes, and so in those classrooms, the special education teacher in that classroom they will they will be working with a general ed education teacher and at the same time they will be their job is to tailor uh lessons or tailor parts of the lessons to help certain students in the classroom that may need certain supports because they're aware they're supposed to be aware of all the kids in the classroom that require that has an IEP and that their IEP requires maybe certain modifications to their um, you know, what they're supposed to learn, how you know how they're supposed to learn. Maybe some kids learn differently. So there's it it it, it covers all of those things. So it's not like so they can be the kid. Can, your child can be in a regular class with regular students. They're not they're not they're not going to be put in a separate class. Only I'm not going to say it does happen. There are some very extreme circumstances where kids are now because of how severe and it'll be obvious at that point. Uh, how severe the situation they may end up being put into a different school, you know, that that deals with the most severe situations. Um, but if your child is kind of like on a kind of like on a, on a their situation is mild but, and they, they can function in the classroom and it's just they have small deficits here and there. Uh, they will be allowed to they, they will be allowed to be in a regular classroom with regular students and it's really really not really I don't think it'll hinder their ability to uh, you know to perform or you know uh, to to learn so um, I think that um, I think it's more of um, a myth and not because and also not because a kid has an IP doesn't mean they're required to take any kind of medication that's a separate thing you know um, in some cases your kids some kids may need medication because depends on their situation and I'm not uh, obviously I'm not a doctor so but you know you you consult with the proper physicians um, if the kid is diagnosed with certain situations certain conditions um, they may they may or they may not need it um, uh, sometimes it helps and I'm not gonna lie you know my son um, uh, in certain when he was much younger um, because uh, I'll say one of the reasons why he was on other medications that were affecting his mood you know and he needed to be on certain medication because muscular dystrophy, they take certain kinds of medication that affects them in different ways. Um, and so you have to take other medication to kind of balance that out. Um, and But now he does not, he's not on those medications anymore, so he doesn't require them. So maybe in the initial years, they may need some things to help support them, um, to help kind of like regulate. Because kids, like, uh, like I said, kids develop, the understanding is kids develop differently. No, no kid, uh, not every kid, if they're born, they could be born on the same day, same, you know, same year, you know, exact same, same time, you know, and uh, their track of development can be can be quite different. Um, so um, to expectations, you know, even as a parent, some parents may have expectations, oh, why this kid is doing this? And so it's like you have to learn your child, um, understand what their needs are, understand like uh, how best you can help them, especially when they're much younger, um, because don't forget the children. That every I think a lot of adults think that the children don't 
you know, we're expecting the child to do certain things a certain, you know, as adults, because we're adults, we're supposed to understand, we understand on a certain level. But children, they, they don't have the same level of understanding. So it's, you have to, as a parent, you have to be patient. You have to do your due diligence, seek as many, much advice as you can, talk to doctors. You can get, uh, you know, you can get second opinions. Um, so, you know, I would say that's kind of like, get, right. try and, to be um, as much in, kind of as, circle as back informed and, as you um, can. Because that'll Bring really back, help you I make just the best say decisions that, uh, for your child. If you are a perfectly healthy adult and you get a diagnosis of having diabetes, you're not going to tell the doctor, no, I don't have diabetes. Um, you know, you follow the recommendations and you you take what you need to get healthy. I feel like it's the same way with an um, a IEP. Uh, give your child what they need so that they can, you know, get as close to their typically developing peers as possible. Um, this was an amazing conversation, Mo. You're very knowledgeable. Um, with this, we're going to be signing off. Uh, follow me at Comadreando Pod on Instagram. If you have any questions at all or um, would like any topics in particular, please feel free to send me a Comadregram or email me at Comadreando at ESCTheNetwork.com. Um, thank you for spending time with your comadre and compadre. Again, thank you, Mo, for joining us. Um, and have a good night. And happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you, Daniel Reg. Happy Thanksgiving. All right. Bye.